Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with PD's awesome guest panel with episode 62. And tonight's guest star is one of my all-time favorites growing up as a little boy. This man has worked on so many projects, such as Curb Your Enthusiasm, Family Matters, not necessarily the news. Honey, I we shrunk ourselves. And of course, my favorite of all times, dinosaurs. Jim Henson's dinosaurs. Now, before I introduce this gentleman tonight, I do want to read uh, his accolades that why this man is so legendary and why he's like one of the best in Hollywood. He is a night winner of the 1987 Cable Ace Award for Best Actor in a Comedy Series for his role as Bob Charles, I believe. Um, my guest at this time is Mr. Stewart Earl Sinclair Pankin. Mr. Stewart, how are you today, sir? Welcome. I missed all that, Peter. Could you do that again a little louder? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, Peter. Uh, how are you? I'm good at you, sir. It's such an honor, man. I've been a fan of yours when I was in diapers. Uh, I, I thank you, I think. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying, like, sorry, it's like, it's, it's a huge honor. I've been a fan of your work. It, not just dinosaurs, it's like other works, too. Like, Life with Louie, I loved you in. I loved you in, like, Aladdin. Honey, we shrunk ourselves. And b before we get into the dinosaur questions, because there's a lot of them, sir, because I'm such an uber fan of dinosaurs, I do want to uh, ask you a couple of uh, preliminary questions, um, if it's okay with you, sir. Sure. Uh, and that and is. Don't call me, sir. My name's but, Stuart. Yes, uh, yes, Stuart. <laughs> I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be, like, giving you the ultimate respect. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, my first question for you is, how did you get started into acting or acting as a whole in general? Uh, take me there. <laughs> wow, that's, you're, you're, that's, a, that's a big general way back question. Uh, I got really interested in, uh, in acting in, in college. Now, I knew I was always sort of an actor kind of person because when I was a kid, I used to, at family dinners, I used to get up in the middle of the room and, you know, ham it up and play around and sing and dance and stuff. Uh, and I was, uh, in college, I, I signed up to be a psychology major because I liked it in high school. But I knew I wanted to, to be an actor, so I auditioned for the first show there, uh, walking across the long, lonely campus. And I got it. I was basically an extra furniture mover. But, uh, you know, my, my professor, teacher, friend Dave Brubaker from college um was was charismatic he was uh, and the whole thing about acting was exciting to me then and i realized to myself that uh, i wanted to be an actor so basically the answer long answer to your question is i got into it in college uh because of the plays we did there um and then uh, i went to graduate school at columbia for uh in theater uh to get a, a an mfa and then I just audition and try to work as much as I can, I could, and did some stuff, a bunch of stuff in New York, and then eventually got a show called The San Pedro Beach Bums, uh, which was filming in California, and that's how I got to California. So, you know, it went from uh, Doctor of Psychology to, you know, stuff to Nelly with The San Pedro Beach Bums. But they, basically college and that route, it was kind of a, a, an ordinary route for some, a lot of people say, why did you go to graduate? Why did you just get out there? I said, well, because I had stuff to learn. Uh, and that's why I went to graduate school. And I'm glad I did. And uh, that's how I got into it. Great story, man. And especially that you put, you, you put your, uh, your education first and then do act. And that's that pretty much I would have done the same exact, exact thing, sir. Yeah, it's not, a bad, uh, it's not a bad route to take because they can teach you stuff in acting school. I mean, Columbia, uh, the MFA program is basically an acting school. Uh, professional actors taught professional, you know, young young people to be actors, and they taught you how to move, how to sing, how to dance, how to how to sword fight, how to talk good, uh, and uh, which came in handy for dinosaurs. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, it's it's not right for everybody, but it was right for me to go to to go to school after uh, after college. Uh, I mean, to go to, yeah, graduate school after college. You mentioned before the guy that, that you mentioned earlier, he had charisma. You, you, are, you yourself also have charisma, Stuart. Like every time I watch Earl Sinclair, it's like not, there's not just top 10 moments of Earl Sinclair. There's like a hundred moments of Earl Sinclair that are just classic, just all oh, classics. <laughs> Anytime. And of course, we, I mentioned it at the start of the, uh, start of the show. And that is uh, your memory on working on not necessarily news as Bob Charles. Uh-huh. Oh, the memories of that. Well, that's 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 a, 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 a an apex of my of my life uh, working on not the, not the news. It's a complicated story. 
uh, I met the producer, Michael Jacobs, auditioning for the San Pedro Beach Bums. Uh, he was an actor and he didn't get it, but he remembered me uh, and he put me in a, in, a, in a show that he was doing called uh, No Soap Radio. Uh, on No Soap Radio, the writer, there was a writer named Ron Richards who wrote for Not Necessarily the News. And I met him in a screening one day. He said, uh, one of our actors has dropped out. Do you want to audition for Not the News? I said, what is that? He said, it's a cable show. I said, what's cable? You know, I mean, it was a time when cable was, there were 29% of the people in the country that had cable. And that wasn't even the pay cable. That wasn't even the showtimes and the, and the HBOs. So I auditioned for Not Necessarily the News. And, uh, and uh, luckily I got it uh, because it was, it was life-changing. In the beginning, it was hard. I mean, we, we used to, our first dressing room was the, sh was the men's room at the Shell Station in Simi Valley in California. And the, and the producers said, try to buy gas so that they won't kick us out. I mean, that was, that's the truth. I mean, the girls were changing costumes, you know, behind open doors of their cars and we were eating lunch on the rocks and the, you know, sh shooing away snakes. Then it got better. Then as, as cable got better, as the National Cable Television Association got stronger, uh, and more people were, were signing up to do cable shows and HBO became popular and Showtime became popular. Uh, then, it, then it got better uh, and uh, the conditions got better and the dressing rooms got better. Uh, money didn't get that much better, but, uh, but the conditions were, were better. And then it became, in the beginning, it was like, oh, I'm doing none of this news. What's that? What's the cable show? And then, you know, later, there was a tremendous amount of pride when, when people asked me what I was doing. And I could say not necessarily the news because it, uh, it, it became, uh, well, a really popular show. And, uh, and even to this day is, uh, is remembered and loved by a lot of people. Now, was this the first uh, Michael Jacobs project you did, though? Because I know I think Michael Jacobs did do, do dinosaurs, right? Yeah, and this was the first Michael Jacobs project I did uh, for uh, you know to, for Michael. Then we did dinosaurs. Then I did a, a guest spot on a, on Girl Meets World, or Bo Girl Meets World. Uh, yep, I, where you played Principal Yancey, right? That's right. Yep. That's right. That so that's you know, and, I, and Michael and I became friends over the years. I mean, we played golf together and we ate together and he's a he's a sharp guy i don't know if he's in the business he's out in florida someplace but he's uh he's made quite a name for himself very clever man absolutely he dominated the whole like tgif lineup back in the 90s though he had dinosaurs on abc tgif he had boy meets world he had yeah. a lot of shows back then i like i remember as a kid watching all these shows i remember dinosaurs was on prime time along with boy meets world and i think step by step who was on at that time like in that lineup I'm going to take your word for it because you know a hell of a lot more than I do. I, I, I did want to ask you, uh, this was uh, my question. My fiance had a question about this too because she's a big fan of Girl Meets World. Uh, what were your memories working on Girl Meets World as Principal Yancey? Uh, good. I mean, most of the shows that I've done, uh, you know, my are very positive feelings about it. I actually had to go in and done, had to. I mean, it was I, I auditioned for it uh, as opposed to Michael knowing me and giving it to me. I, I auditioned for it. And uh, went in, and, and the cast was swell, and uh, the conditions were great. Joel Zwick was the director of that episode, who I had done a movie with years ago in Boston called uh, Second Sight. So I knew Joel uh, from years ago. And uh, it, it was all, you know, it's when you get somebody like Michael that, that's, and Joel that are such uh, professionals, consummate professionals, the, the set is always, the set stinks or smells good from the top and if you have somebody good at the top like michael and joel then then everything goes smoothly there's no problems you do the scenes uh, nobody yells at anybody you know the actors were nice uh usually when you're a guest spot you come on and you know you're you're sort of a second class citizen which is fine just as long as the check doesn't bounce mm -hmm. uh there was an actor that i became friendly with during the run called tony Oh man, Anthony, he played, he was in the original Boy Meets World. Uh, and he's, he sounded like the actor, who did Zorba the Greek? Tony Quinn. His name was Anthony oh. Quinn, Tony Quinn. A great guy, great, good actor. And so I became friends with him, which made him very nice. But, you know, to, to, I mean, there's no real, I don't remember anything terrible. I don't remember, but I don't remember anything like spectacular. It was just a good, solid working show with a lot of very good professional people. 
cool. And now you mentioned guest spots too. You guest spot and probably one of my favorite guest spots you did, and that was on Family Matters as Honest Bob, the car salesman, the the the, the shady car salesman where Laura tries to buy a car, and every time she shows up, you have a different disguise. I remember one time you showed up with the fake mustache. Oh, I was laughing when I was a kid. Your oh. memory, your memories of working on Family Matters. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, same thing. Uh, you know, the, uh, the show had been going on for a long time. And they were very nice to us. I remember, the one thing I do remember is we had a run through. And who played Urkels? Who, who, who? Uh, Jaleel White. Jaleel White. I think I'm pronouncing it wrong, but it's Jaleel White. Yeah, he, I remember he came into the, into the note session at the end. You come into a room, you sit down, you get notes with a paper bag over his head. Everybody said, what are you doing? <laughs> That I was terrible. I was terrible in that run through. I don't want anybody to see me. I'm so embarrassed. That I remember. <laughs> uh, and family, family matters. I didn't work with him, but Barry Jenner, who was on that show as a, as a recurring party, played a cop. I think uh, he uh, he became a very dear friend of mine. He was on that show. I'm sorry I didn't work with him. And then I had an interview once with the uh, with the father on that show, who played the father, Peter. Um. Oh, I know his name on the show was Wins. I'm just trying to remember what his real name was. I think. Well, it was anyway, we we had a we we inter we had a, a like an interview show that we did together, and uh, I I remember liking him very much. But the the, the memories of these shows that I've done, and I, I'm you know I, I'm fairly long in the tooth. You know, I've been doing it for a long time. I I don't necessarily remember tremendous specifics except that paper bag thing. That was very funny. <laughs> uh, but I just remember. People interview me sometimes, and they say, what were things like? And I say, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I have no bad stories, for the most part, of, of, of any of the work that I've done. It's all bad. I mean, this is show business, man. This isn't, you know, this is this is what you want to do. This is fulfilling your, your, your ambition. I mean, it's not really work. Work, as my friend would say, is laying bricks and pouring tar on a, on a road. I mean, this is... This is this is some place that you. This is your happy place. Is the expression I hate, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, this is a place that, uh, and every set is exciting. I still think about walking. If I walked up to a set today, it would still be exciting. You know, to see the backs of flats, as my as my old teacher would say, it's oh. something exciting about the backs of flats behind the scenes that are uh, that are exciting. So showbiz has been very very good to me. I mean, it's <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good life. And definitely, you know, you're a legend in all everything you do, uh, Stuart. Like, I, there's every role you did. I don't think there's one that wasn't that that you didn't perfect it. You perfected every every role you did. So. That's very kind. Thank you. Anytime. And of course, oh, another one of my favorite roles you did was in the 1997 Honey We Shrunk Ourselves as Gordon Salinsky. Uh, Gordon mem Salinsky. Mer yeah. uh, memories. Memories. Yeah, a lot of memories. That was the first made-for-video movie. I think that was ever made. It was made to go right direct to video. Uh, um, it was a third of that series. Honey, we shrunk ourselves. Honey, we, honey, we shrunk the kids. Honey, we blew, honey, up, we the blew up the baby. Blew up the baby. Yep. And then, and then this one. It was directed by Dean Cundey, who was Steven Spielberg's uh, top DP. You know, in in many of his movies, and it, you know, and working with Rick Moranis uh, and. Uh, you got to get the names of the other girls because Rob, Robin, and, and I, I don't remember. I'm I don't remember your name, Peter. It's, 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 I'm reading it now. But they, you know, there were four of us. It was like a four-hander, and we spent you know a few a bunch of weeks together, and it was green screen, so there was a lot of special effects. It was kind of nifty and oversized furniture. You know, climbing up the backs of chairs and you know uh, and and pretending that we're being attacked by cockroaches and spiders and stuff. Uh, it was cool. It was a good story. Uh, Allison, uh, 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 all right, I'm going to, Mila Kunis, I know, who is now very famous. Yep, family. Was, yeah, she, uh, she played a little part in it. And uh, it was just, it was just a, a nice experience. We were down in, in the old Howard Hughes, where he built the spruce scoots. They, they transformed that, that uh, warehouse into a studio. And we shot there for weeks and, uh, and just had a great time. We laughed and Rick was, was, you know, he was just great. I mean, he's an admirable man. He left show business. His wife died much too young, uh, sadly. And he left show business at, and closely after uh, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves to take care of his kid. He just gave up show business. And that's, 
a tremendously admirable thing. I think he's back. He's getting back in the business now, which is great because he's a very funny, very talented guy. But the memories of, of Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, uh, I, actually, I actually wrote a little song. I write songs occasionally for movies that I, you know, and I don't remember it, but they, Dean Cundy, secretly I recorded, and he, I, I was singing it, he recorded. And, you know, so there's a lot of very warm memories. And I was also, interesting, the last shot I did on Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, I had just gotten uh, a role in, in striptease, Demi Moore's striptease. So I went from that set, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, at night, to the airport to fly to Florida to start my work on striptease. So it was a very exciting time for, for me, for an actor. Anytime you can get, you know, a job going into another job is heaven. It's just heaven. <laughs> totally agree. Um, were you in the, the, the chip scene where like the kids were like eating the chips and like in the Honey We Shrunk Ourselves? You mentioned the scene where you were fighting off like bugs. Like, I think it was a scene in Honey We Shrunk Ourselves where the kids were like having a party and they had like chips and dip. Yeah. And I think, were you in that scene or no? Well, we weren't in that scene because we were small. We were shrunk by that time. Okay. But when they were eating chips and dip, one of the things that Rick and I had to do was we jumped into a bubble uh, <laughs> to, to see what was going on with the kids. So it was a CGI bubble. And then the bubble broke and we fell into that dip. And one of the gags was that the camera showed somebody coming down with a chip and then they cut to us and, and we were going to be scooped up by a, by a chip. So in a sense... We were kind of in that scene, but we weren't in that scene. We were never, except in the beginning and maybe the very end, we weren't with the with the other actors, with the kids. Uh, we were just mostly the, the the four the four adults were crawling around trying to find out what was happening and trying to get big again. Hmm. And of course, I I want to know, like, uh, can you tell me more about like your audition for Dinosaurs? I'm curious to know about that. Yeah, I mean, if it, I was, that's another peak uh, of, of, of my, my life. Uh, it's a, it was a great job to have. Every actor in California auditioned for dinosaurs because doing voiceovers, which you may or may not know, is a great gig. It's just, it's just a great gig. Uh, so I auditioned for it. I think I auditioned for it once in a room full of huge people. I mean, a lot of those showrunners and writers of, of dinosaurs went on to become uh, really uh, popular and successful writers and showrunners on their own. You know, they, a lot of them had ter terrific careers. Uh, I can't answer that phone. I'm talking to Peter. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so I auditioned for it. I mean, it was real simple. I auditioned for it. And I, there was an actor, an old actor named Davey Burns, who, who uh, was in a lot of old movies, but he was in a movie called It's Always Fair Weather, and he always sang... Though the time has come for parting and the martial music. For, so I kind of use that as a basis for, uh, for, uh, for Earl. Uh, I didn't want to go the Jackie Gleason route, you know, although everybody compares Earl to, to, you know, to uh, Jackie Gleason to the Honeymooners. But basically, I, I came in with that voice and I, and, I, and I auditioned for it and I got it. It took us two full eight hour days just to do the first half hour pilot uh, because they wanted to make it, you know, really right. So we spent an awful lot of time doing that, doing that pilot. And, uh, and then the show uh, launched and it, and it took off for three years. And now, uh, thankfully, because it's been re-released on Disney Plus, uh, many people are, uh, are um, aware of the show again or coming back to the show. You know, or aware of it for the first time. I mean, if when I get uh, autograph requests, and, and it's usually through dinosaurs. I mean, they send me those punk boxes, Funko Punko boxes, and uh, and to, to sign. And it's mostly the vast majority of them. Uh, during the pandemic, they were flying them because nobody had anything to do but write to me. <laughs> they were uh, they were flying off, uh, you know, off my desk. So yeah, dinosaurs is still uh, is is still in the mix in people's minds. I mean, like you know, you still have the DVDs, sir. <laughs> yeah, they're great. <laughs> you know, let me tell you something, Peter. It's it's a very good show. It was a very good show. The concept of it, uh, kids liked it because of the puppets, uh, and the and the adults liked it because of the of the secret you know adult themes uh, that they sneaked in there. And uh, I mean, the sets were great. It looked great. It was the most expensive half hour 
television show at the time, and maybe to this day, uh, which is one of the reasons it didn't go on after three years. It was just so expensive to maintain those animatronic, the animatronic puppets and the technology that, uh, that caused the dinosaurs to, to move and to make their faces and stuff. It was, it was very complicated. Uh, I used to hang out at the, I didn't, didn't work on the set. The voiceover people worked in the, in the studio, but I used to, you know, hang out on the set. And sometimes if my school had a, a fundraiser, I used to donate with the largesse of the producers, a, a tour of the set of dinosaurs to the people who, who, who bid on it. And it was cool as a conniption to go down and see that set. It was really, it was really nice. And to, and those Henson people, they're, I mean, they know what they're doing. You know, Kevin Clash, who did the baby. Kevin and I did a, uh, a, a I think we did a, a, a lullaby a disc for dinosaurs or a lullaby stories. It was a, you know, like a fairy tale disc. I was Earl and he was the baby. And, and we, we, you know, tell me a story, tell me a story. So, you know, and, and we did that. And, and all those guys are, 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 are great. We were lucky, the voiceover people, because the Hanson people usually do their own voices. They're very, they're proud to do that. But luckily, the producers and maybe ABC didn't didn't want them to do the voices for whatever reason. I don't know. Well, my puppeteer was a little English guy and talked like this. Hello, honey, I'm home. Train, can I have some dinner? You know, they obviously didn't want that, so they needed a voice to to, to replace that. And uh, knock on wood, it was me. And. I, I do got to say, too, like with, with dinosaurs, though, like I really love like how, like you said, it was a great show because it covered topics that you wouldn't see on a regular children's show. It covered like environmentalism. It covered sexual harassment. It covered, I'm not going to say, but the mating dance episode, it covers that reference. I'm not going to say what it is. Um, and then, you know, it, it deals with like, you know, stuff like puberty. Like, I just love the whole concept of like, it's supposed to be a children's show, but there's a lot of adult themes in this wow. show. A lot. I mean, that's one of the reasons that it, it could be enjoyed by the whole family yep. is because, you know, various ages, parents and kids could enjoy various aspects of it. I mean, whether the kids understood, you know, the, the sexual harassment episode or the climate change episode or the, you know, or, or the drug episode, who, who knows? But they enjoyed to see these puppets walking around and, 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 and having fun. You're, you're right. And and, and it's very interesting, too, because Fraggle Rock experience, uh, ex experimented with this, but they did half puppets, half robot uh, animatronic things, where dinosaurs, it was mainly all animatronics. Like you said, like you had a person working the head, you had the person working the body, which I think for Earl Sinclair, I could be wrong on this, Seward, but I think it was uh, Bill Beretta that was in the body of Earl Sinclair, right? You're not wrong. <laughs> um, and you provided the voice, because I always see at the end of the credits, it would say, uh, Earl Sinclair, voice, Stuart Pankins, body, Bill Beretta. And then, and then I think the legs, I think it was someone else. It was a third person. Well, the third person was Mac Wilson. He was the guy that worked the animatronic board. Very complicated technology. They reprogrammed it for each show so that the expressions of the puppets, one day this finger could be this, you know, putting your in on another time, this. They reprogrammed based on the material in the script. So Mac Wilson was the uh, was the operator and the and the and the track, the the scratch track guy, as we say, the guy who just did the voice for us to hear. Bill was in the was in the suit. Who is Ben? Bill is now a big producer um, uh, in uh, uh, in the Henson Company. He's really you know blossomed into a big guy. And me, who did the voice. So there were three people that was that needed to be in work each puppet, and each puppet had that had that. Uh, treat, uh, threesome. Interesting. And, and, I, and I was going to lead to my next question too, because I always wondered the, the mechanics. I've seen the behind the scenes stuff on the dinosaur DVD where, like we mentioned before, like the eyes, the mouth, and the, and the body are, you know, they're controlled separately. But when you're mm -hmm. working on a show, like an episode, and doing a scene like as Earl Sinclair, are you like right here, like on the side doing the voice while the people are in the body? Like, how does that go when shooting an episode? No, they, they, well, I'll start with this. In, vo in cartoon voice voiceovers, you sit around a room with a lot of uh, wonderful people and you read the script and, you, and whatever character you're given, you do that. You read the script and you create a character based on the script and everybody is sitting next to you and does their part and we read back and forth. In Dinosaurs, I was rarely, if ever, on the set when they did it. They would do the script, Mac and Bill and... Uh, and uh, 
Mac and Bill would do the uh, mac and cheese. Would do the uh, would do the the, the the mouth movement, the scratch track voice, and Bill would do the movement. Then it would come to the studio, and I would see this. Hmm. You know, like, hi, honey, I'm home. But I hear, hi, honey, I'm home, because Mac was doing the voice. And I had to reply, you know, hi, honey, I'm home. You know, so that was, that's the way we did that show. We replaced the mouth, the, the voice, and try to coordinate it to the mouth movement as best we can. It was, it, it was a little tricky. Toward the end, we, we, we sort of, the, the guys in the suit and who were doing the set work sort of got my rhythm. So they kind of ch changed some of the stuff they've done to, to match what I discovered in the booth. And I changed some things because of what they did on the set. So it was a real interesting collaborative effort, but very different than voiceovers, than cartoon voices. I can see that. And, and how awesome though was the set though? Like the props, like how amazing did the set and the props look on that show? Great. I mean, it was great. The oversized stuff and uh, and just the background and the trees and the set was built. The main set of the house was built up so that puppeteers could go underneath. Like when, when Kevin did the, the baby, he stuck his hand up through the floor and into the, and the grandma too. The beautiful floor. Uh, Florence Stanley, right? Yeah, it's family, the great Florence Stanley. Yeah, so, that's, that, so that was kind of cool to watch that. But it, it was great. I mean, everything was, like I said, great. Yeah, it was definitely one of my favorite shows. And, of course, Earl Sinclair is probably one of the best TV dads ever. Uh, did you have a favorite Earl Sinclair line? Line? Or any, or, or lines. It can be as much as you want, sir. Well, I mean, one of them, one of them was, I'm talking to Richfield, Sherman Hemsley, and, uh, and he was screaming at me, and I think Earl said at one point, shall I expose, expose my soft underbelly for you now, sir? <laughs> was some, that I thought was very funny. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, honey, I'm home. I mean, that's, that, that I, I say that all the time and so does everybody else. Uh, I, I really enjoyed, I don't remember lines. I mean, we did, we did like 80 shows, so, or 60 shows. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the last episode. It was kind of controversial. Uh, the last episode of Dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs died. I don't yeah. want to have spoilers. Soon, I remember watching that episode, and I remember when you talked to Earl Sinclair, I remember as a little boy, I cried. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry about that, but like, you're not alone. And and the show was was kind of it was criticized. It was commented on in the form, and it was criticized. They said, "How could you do that to kids? How could you make them cry, and kill their, their dinosaurs?" Well, it, it was it was tough, but it had to be done because there ain't no dinosaurs around. No. But you're not the only one who was emotionally connected with that show. And when those dinosaurs, you know, they didn't die on screen, first of all. No, no. But the implication was very strong. Yeah, honey, I mean, you know, yeah, we're going to be fine. The snow's coming. And you know, people were, were, were uh, connected enough to those dinosaurs to go in that. They, they went away. Kids felt it. It, it, they did, and I, I rewatched the whole series. I rewatched the first episode, The Mighty Men wow. of Chorus, and I rewatched the last episode, which is Change in Na Nature. And I found it very interesting that Earl Sinclair once in the first episode said to Baby Sinclair, he said, "One day this will be all yours. Dinosaurs will be on this earth forever." And then your final line in Change in Nature was, and I have it right here. Uh, well, there's no place to, I can read it right now. After all, dinosaurs have been on this earth for 150 million years, and it's not like we're just gonna disappear and you said it like that and then it was over yep you had yeah. the final line not counting a howard and up me line howard hand up me that's right i, I still laugh he, at that name <laughs> yeah it's a great name it's yeah, howard <laughs> hand up me is one of the, it's one of the classics michael jacobs the producer used to do some of those voices he, he enjoyed that um with your blessing and permission sir can i tell you at least my three favorite lines of earl sinclair sure Okay, my favorite one, one of my favorites is when you go in New Leaf, and then, uh, of course, that episode was basically about marijuana, that episode, and Earl goes in there high, talking to uh, Richfield, and you go as uh, Earl Sinclair, you go, in there, I bet there's a free spirit there, let him free, big guy, let him come out and play! I love when you said <laughs> That's that. That's very good. I'm glad you did an audition for the show. <laughs> uh, and, and then there's another line you said, and I absolutely died laughing. Uh, it was the one, it was, I think it was Power to Erupt, where like uh, Jason Willinger as Robbie goes to you. He goes, Dad, uh, Mom is taking all that fun. I mean, yeah, who, who's the boss around here? And, and you go, yeah, Fran? And she goes, what? And then she go, you go, she is. 
<laughs> when someone so it's so called yeah. Yeah. she is yeah yeah again okay. jessica walter the great jessica walter i was gonna ask you your uh, memories of course working with the late jessica walters uh well we became you know friends after that uh, during that uh she's great she's what a career she had i mean i mean she's just a consummate wonderful professional person uh in the beginning uh the first i'm just gonna guess three episodes we all sat around the table at abc and read the script so we got to know each other a little bit that way sally and jessica and jason and uh, sam mcmurray who played uh roy and was sherman there? Fought, huh was sherman there you know, I think he was. I think he was. I couldn't swear to it because, you know, he hated us. No, he didn't. I was going to say, is he much scarier as he is on, on dinosaurs? Uh, no, he's not scary at all. He's little and I could take him. I really could. Uh, but we used to sit around and read the script. And after those episodes, th they realized they didn't have to waste time and money doing that. So we all went in and, uh, and, uh, and did our, our, our voices on our own. We all sat in the studio on our own. But... You know, and luckily, Jessica, uh, we stayed in touch. You know, we had, we actually went over to their house for dinner once. Florence Stanley, Florence was, uh, we went to their house. They, they had a dinner for us at one point. I took Florence out to lunch once. Uh, Sally, I see on sets occasionally, voiceover sets or auditions. Uh, and Jason, I don't see a lot. And Sam, I used to play golf with a lot. So we stayed in touch. Uh, but, it, you know, as far as those are the closest relationships that I had with those actors, with those particular actors through Dinosaurs. I mean, we, it's not like we showed up each other and worked a week on a set and went home for the weekend and came back. So it wasn't that kind of relationship. But uh, we all liked each other. We all stayed in, you know, we all stayed in touch for a while anyway. And uh, and Jessica, I mean, she's, I hesitate to say that she's iconic. She, you know, played Misty for me and you know, and, and uh, what was that show she did? Uh, uh, I don't remember. But she was on, she's been on television for years and years and years. Sally, of course, you know, who was Sally the, uh, all the family. So, you know, um, there were terrific people to work with, even though we didn't really work with each other. You know, it would have been interesting and impossible if we'd sat around all together in a studio like the voice of, like the cartoon world, and did our scenes together. It, things could have been very different, but it was impossible because of the technology and the and the technical problems of doing that. But uh, it was, like I said, it was a peak of my life, and uh, I'm still, you know, and when people, if people, you know, reach out to me, it's through dinosaurs. Yeah, and you, you mentioned... Um... You know, first, I always thought you and Florence had such great chemistry with Ethel and Earl always going at it, like back and forth with each other. I thought you two were like probably the most funniest duo I've seen on any sitcom. Well, th thank you. I would, you know, if, if in another world, if they wanted to have some sort of a spinoff, you know, either real life or, or, or puppets with me and Florence, I would have jumped in the chains. I mean, she's, she's great. I actually wrote uh, some songs for the Dinosaurs Big Song album. And one of them was, well, I, one of them was, I'm the baby, God, I love me. So that was on there. And then for Jessica and Florence, I wrote, he's a lizard and I love him. And then Florence would come in, he's a lizard, he's a moron. And I love him, he's a jerk. You know, so uh, at least at least some of my words got into her mouth because uh, she's great. She, there, there are Jessica and, and Florence, great, just great. Even like your your dialogue with with the late Sherman Helmsley, like I remember one episode. I think it was I forgot what it was called. I think it was called "And the Winner Is," where him and Earl were running for elder, like a uh, chief elder of the the show. And I remember this whole dialogue where I just you had me dying laughing though. It was <laughs> where, it was the debate. It was where I think Edward R. Morrow. Or, or like a parody of like uh, Edward Ed uh, Murrow, and he's doing a mo he's being a moderator, and you as Earl go, let me just open my statement by saying I would make a very bad elder, I, and then and then Sherman goes in rebuttal, I agree with him one hundred percent, and then the moderator goes, Mister Sinclair, do you know what you're saying? And then you go, no, not usually, and he goes, are you telling your voters to vote for Mister Richfield? And you go, no, 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 no. You see, I may be a complete boob, but he's absolute evil, and then he goes on this, and then you go as Earl, you go. You are evil. You told me so lots of times. He told me, he picked me to run against him and told me I had to lose. You are astounding. You are a dinosaur walking compendium of knowledge. 
And the, I don't remember. I don't remember half that stuff, but uh, I'm glad you do. Oh man, it just brings back a lot of good memories. I I remember that. I just remember like, like in the episode Power Erupt, uh, not Power Up, but a New Leaf, when you're singing. It's the most unusual day. It's like catching the bride of bouquet. And I'm like, oh, Jason and Stuart are killing this very, very good. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> no problem. And there was one more. I'm trying to remember what it was. I'll remember it later. But I definitely want to talk about some of these uh, classic episodes that we mentioned earlier. Of course, New Leaf being one of them. And that dealt with the issues of uh, marijuana use. Uh, memories of shooting this episode. Uh, you know, some you, 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 I don't remember specifics about shooting any of the episodes. I mean, to me, they were scripts in a, in, a, in a studio. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to evade it. I just don't remember the specifics of the episodes. Like I said, we did 60 of them, and it wasn't like I have any visual clues to remember various moments of the episodes. I, there are words. I, I can't help you by, you know, remembering uh, a lot of specifics in a lot of specific episodes. So hate me if you if you want. I just can't. I, I don't remember. I just don't. I'd have to. If 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 I were as uh, what's the word uh, professional as you, I would have looked at some of this stuff. But I didn't because I'm too old. I, I remember the line by the way, uh, Stuart. It was in Nuts to War. I think this was the one where the where the four leggers were fighting the. Uh, the dinosaurs. I mean, there was a feud between the two sides, and you, I, they did this parody. I'm trying to remember what the name of the sisters were that were in the war. They sang, uh, uh, on a, I forgot what it was. On. It was a parody of the three si sisters that sang during, I think, World War II. Oh, and, the Andrew sisters. The, the what was it? The Andrew sisters. The Andrew sisters. And I remember you going, like, you were singing, like, with this German accent, won't you lie? And then, you know, hello, soldier, do you have a... A, w a woman at home, and he goes, yeah, my mom. And then you break character and go as Earl Sinclair. Well, you better give her a call right now. And then you go right back to speaking in German. <laughs> you got it. That's great that you know all this. And I, I'm sorry that I can't help you out, but like I said, 60 episodes, and I don't remember a lot of specifics. Um, but but I, I do got to ask, too, like, uh, what was uh, Sherman like, um, working with Sherman? Well, like I said, we've only, we only, if we got together, it was, uh, it was three, epi three episodes when we sat around the table reading the scripts. We never worked together. I mean, the actors in the, 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 the characters in Dinosaurs never worked together. Uh, we, uh, if we saw each other, it was at that reading. But we just, you know, we, 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 did, the, we, we did our own parts separately. I don't, I, don't, I, can't, I don't have a lot of strong memory about meeting Sherman. I know who he was. He was, you know, kind of, kind of famous. Uh, but as far as, as far as working with them, we never worked together. I mean, that's, that's the absolute truth. True. Sure. And I, I do got to ask you too, when doing the voice of Earl Sinclair, there's like certain scenes where like, I'm just trying to remember, I think this episode was germ warfare where, where a baby is sick and he's delirious and he's picturing his family members in a very negative light. And you had this very high pitch voice as Earl Sinclair going, wait, and then no more juice, no more food, no more fun. We're going to make you wear tight, scratchy diapers. And then we're going to take you to a department store and leave you there. It's like, when you do that voice, like the high pitch voice, is that them like high, like a, a machine doing that? Or is that you like, doing the high pitch voice of Earl Sinclair. Well, no, any, any voice that came out of, you know, that, that came out of Earl was me. Okay. So I guess I did it. Like I said, I don't remember that specifics, but if I did that, it was me trying to scare the hell out of the baby. You did a great job. You scared me, but not, but I, I was a two-year boy. You scared me in Mission I'm so glad. <laughs> you did, you, and I won't lie to you, uh, Stuart, when I first watched Dinosaurs, that beginning, if you're a little kid, that that is uh, like open to interpretation. The way like he comes off all menacing, all serious. Like he's coming through the woods. He looks like he's gonna eat somebody. It's like I'm not gonna lie. That opening, that first ten seconds of dinosaurs opening, was very intimidating for me back then. Wow, that's very interesting to hear. I wonder if that's the case with a lot of young people because that's obviously what it was intended to do. You're supposed to see this huge megalosaurus tromping through the dinner, and then you then you through the uh, the forest, and then you cut to his face, and he and he's sort of a little bit of a pussycat at that point honey i'm home you know i mean so yeah that was that was the way it was written and that was the way it was intended to be so i'm sorry i scared you oh i loved it it gave me memories <laughs> well um uh, I do want to ask before we uh, conclude, I have a couple of uh, more questions though since you did do a lot of voice acting work and you're one of the best too and you're one of my I'm sorry 
What did you, you say? Just for freezing a little bit. Oh. Okay. Um, no, I was saying like you know you've done a lot of voice acting um, in the past though, and one of the works I've I loved you on was Life with Louis, uh, as Mr. Flanagan. Uh, memories of working on Life with Louis and working with Louis Anderson. Well, like I said, when you do voiceovers like that, you're all in a room, and I, I, I my vague memory of it is Louis was there, uh, uh, and we were all sitting around the, the the studio in front of a microphone, doing doing our bit. Again, I, I don't remember a lot. I remember him. I remember, you know, and, and thinking that he was a tremendously funny guy. And, you know, we full-figured guys have to stick together. So I would say, good, good on you, Louie. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad you like Life of Louie. And I, but I don't, again, remember a, a lot of specifics about the filming. I don't remember. I, I, my vision of working as a voiceover actor is sitting in a room different studios, I do remember that, with some wonderful people, Dan Castellaneta and Charlie Adler, I mean, all these wonderful voiceover actors and, and directors, uh, and, you know, saying the line and the director would, would stop you, give you notes, and then you do it again and again until they, until they got it the way they liked it. But that's, it's sort of a wash, you know, I mean, it's all kind of the same uh, when, you do the, when you do those voiceovers, especially if you come in as a guest box. Now, if you're a regular, if you're Batman or, or Robin, you know, when you come in, or I did, I did, I think I did at least one, maybe two Batman and um, Luke Skywalker, name, now, name, <laughs> who played, Mark, Mark Hamill. <laughs> yeah, Mark Hamill. <laughs> and he was there and he played the Joker and I just was marveling at the way he came up with this character. I mean, I can't do it, but it was, uh, but basically that's what I remember about voiceover work, sitting in a room with a bunch of talented, you know, actors uh, reading a script. As far as specifics, don't remember a lot. Of, and I really, I'm sorry, I don't remember a lot about Life with Louie. No worries, uh, Stuart. Like, would the same apply to, like, when you worked on Aladdin, the animated series, as you, you played Sultan Pasta al Dente? Pasta al Dente, I remember that. Yeah, I, again, I remember sitting next to Dan Castellaneta and, and a bunch of other uh, 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 actors. Could I tell you what the shows were about? Could I tell you what the dialogue was about? No, I can't. I can't do that. Uh, um, because like I said, it's all kind of, it's the same work. Uh, and I'm sure, I, I'm, I'm betting you that these guys who do voiceovers as for a living and to make a real living at it. I mean, if they remember, God bless them. I, I, I know, I mean, I, I, I don't. I just remember, like I said, it's a great job to have. You can go to your work, go to work in your underwear. You know, you do your, uh, you do your voiceover stuff, and then you go home. It's, it's, a, it's a nifty, it's a nifty way to make a living. Agree, I totally agree. And of course, uh, one of the final questions I had, of course, was your time on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Well, that was cool. I mean, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, um, I played, everybody thinks I played a rabbi, but I didn't. I played the head of a kidney consortium that, that chooses the kidneys for, for, for the recipients. And, and Larry David wanted Richard Lewis to have a kidney. So he smashed into my car so he could meet me. Uh, that I do remember. See, as an act, when, when I'm on set, I remember stuff. And then we had a couple of scenes in a deli and we went up to Lake Arrowhead and we had a skiing scene and a scene in a, in a chalet. Uh, and the nice thing about Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, is that you don't have to learn lines. I mean, <laughs> you, they, they give you, they kind of give you the plot. They're very closed mouthed about it. If you're on the set the first day, for instance, and you say to the assistant director, what's the show about? And he goes, well, you'll find out when you get on the set. You know, and, can't you tell me? No, you'll find out when you get on the set. Because I didn't want anything to be not spontaneous. So when you get on the set, they give you uh, the, the log line, basically. You have to mention this. You have to mention the Yankees. You have to mention your, your daughter. You have to mention your Jewish religion. You have to mention, that's what they give you. And then he comes in and he starts and you, you know, as an improvisational game, I guess, but it's on film. You sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a tennis match back and forth. And, you, and, and if you don't get it right, like if I'm making this up, but if I say, yeah, Larry, when I went to, uh, when I went to Jersey the other, I was cut. Now you can't say Jersey because that comes in in another show. So say New York if you have to. Uh, okay. When I went to New York that day and I met my wife cut, well, you can't say you're married. You know, it's like, it's like that. So eventually you get, you get what, what they get, what they want you to say, not necessarily exactly what they want you to say, but 
the, the information in it. And that's the way Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, worked. And it was, uh, it, was, it was great because it was all fresh. It was all, you know, it was, it was spontaneous. It was new. It was, uh, you didn't know what was going on because you never read a script. It was, it was exciting work. I would love to, you know, I, I would love to have been a regular on that show because that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Do you prefer uh, acting over voice acting or vice versa? Well, um, acting. I mean, you know, my first choice would be the stage. I came from the stage doing plays in the East. And, uh, and even here, I uh, uh, did a lot of plays in Los Angeles. But yes, yeah, stage acting is, is the best because it's, it's an actor's medium. Film and television are a director's medium. And you don't have any control once you put it put it on film it's it's not yours anymore but on stage that the relationship with the audience especially if you're doing comedy you hear those laughs or even a drama where you can just feel the tension that's that's where the money is for me uh being in film and television is a good living that's for sure and it, <laughs> it makes you kind of popular uh and there's nothing wrong with that man i mean i i, I you know we did not necessarily the news for six years you did dinosaurs for three years i mean it's always it's always fun to work like i said being on a set if i walked on a set tomorrow it would still be those cameras and those lights you know it would be still be exciting i have to ask you sewer did you see like when the simpsons uh parodied dinosaurs when the simpsons actually made a parody of dinosaurs no no i have to watch that can i sue them oh um <laughs> I'll send you the clip. Like it was an episode. There was it was like a 10 second clip of them watching a parody of dinosaurs. Really? Yeah, I gotta send you. Oh, I'll send you it after this interview. I promise. Cool, uh, cool. And now, uh, now, Stuart. Before we conclude, this is the part of the show where, like, the, uh, this is my show is an open forum. You, this is the part where my guests could say they could talk about anything they want. They can promote, hype, anything they want. The floor is yours, uh, Stuart. Wow. Uh, well, I. <laughs> I just want to thank, you know, the people like you, Peter, and all those other fans out there that keep that, <coughs> excuse me, to keep me going and to keep my work alive. Um, I, I am on now something called Cameo. You know what that is? Of course. Where, uh, yeah, I'm on Cameo and something called Memo, which is a European version, where people can get in touch with me and, uh, and I can send messages to them or to their friends, family, enemies, you know, loved ones, hated ones. Uh, so I, I wouldn't mind pushing that. That that's a, that's kind of fun for me to do. I just started that. Uh, so if you want to look into that cameo and memo, uh, that'd be that'd be great. Otherwise, you know, I'm just you know thrilled as punch that people like you, you know, still you know watch and, and enjoy because you know that's a legacy. That's something you know nobody wants to wants to go in the ground you know forgotten. And, and thanks to people like you. Uh, I, I have a feeling I'm not going to be forgotten. So, you know, and, uh, and although I haven't, I don't have anything to push right now because I haven't done anything for, you know, since pre-pandemic, actually. Uh, I'm just, I want to thank the, the, the fans out there and the viewers and the audience uh, for watching and remembering. Thank you. Thank you. And and before we uh, before I uh, we send off though, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, you are. I'm just gonna reinforce exactly what you just said. You are not only a legend, but you're actually one of my favorite voice actors of all times. In the Dan Castellaneta, Rob Paulson, I can go on. Rob Paulson, Charlie Adler, Jim Cummins, all these names. Uh, Dee Dee Khan, happy birthday. Happy uh, birthday. Happy birthday, Ms. Khan. Um, and you know, just so many voice actors I just grew up admiring, idling. And my, uh, this was an idea, like, just doing interviews like this, to interview some of my favorite voice actors and actresses, like, like yourself, uh, Stuart. Just to give, this gives me an opportunity to say thank you for those memories you gave me as a kid watching Dinosaurs, watching Life with Louie, watching Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, even watching Family Matters on TGIF every <laughs> single Friday. And well, thank you, pal. Thank you so much. One last thing before you go, and I feel like you deserve this, and that is thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. But in all seriousness, um, it's been a real honor, sir. Like uh, to it's been a pleasure, real pleasure, Peter. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and you have an awesome night, sir. You too, pal. Have a good night, man. You too, Peter. <laughs>